The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Podcast. Today I'm joined, in fact, we've been talking for about 15 minutes um, it's been quite hilarious. There's been jokes aplenty. Um, we even just referenced uh, Richard Mercer from Love Song Dedication. So, um, Sam, if, at the end, if there is enough time, I will obtain your Love Song Dedication. But in the, in, in the intervening period, ladies and gentlemen, I'd love to introduce Sam Pereira, who's the founder of Pereira Crowther. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. My pleasure to be here. And apart from the hilarity of the Love Songs, um, we'd love, uh, you know, Clearly a, a, a fan of romance, we'd probably like to have a little bit more meat in the bones about your actual story. As be the engine room, we like to try and figure out what makes a business in 2024, but a lot of it's the history, the tapestry of what got you here. Yeah. So tell us the same story. Well, you know, talk about history, it's close to uh, 19 years since I first uh, joined our wonderful profession. Um and Roxy, I was really drawn to the business of financial advice rather than um, financial advice itself. So I consider myself a business owner and a business person first um, and a financial advisor second. Uh, and, and I learned that very early on in my career when I started in 2000. Um, and, and five, um, my dear friend, Russell Collins, who's a, a legend in our profession and a great mentor, probably someone that's uh, being the person that's most shaped my professional career, um, said very early on, it was a client concept. He said, there are two sources of income, man at work and capital at work. And obviously with man at work, there are only so many hours. Um, and this concept uh, really rung true with me. So over the course of the 19 years that we've been in business, uh, I have, um, you know, worked hard of putting our, our capital at work, uh, our, our human beings, our team, um, and our financial capital and continue to invest and reinvest in the business. Um, so here we are in, uh, June 2024, nearly 19 years on and, um, got a, a, a wonderful team of eight, uh, servicing about a thousand clients, mostly professionals and some corporates, um, in looking after their risk management and insurance um, insurance needs. Can I ask you a question about Russell Collins? Yes. Because um, his name is, is iconic and I yes. can remember um, doing a business insurance session with him back in the yes. day and, in fact, obtaining C- CDs for all of you kids <laughs> out there on, on, on his training. Yes. Were, you, uh, were you involved in a specialisation for life insurance before you'd done the – Spoken with Russell Collins, or was that did he shape the way in which you viewed financial advice? No, absolutely, and and, and a great question. Um, I was studying accounting, running a bar uh, whilst I was doing that, and it was a life insurance specialist that recruited me. Not studying for the bar, <laughs> running a bar. Everyone, he's my son of guy. <laughs> 
But uh, no, I was drawn uh, in into the profession by a life insurance specialist, um, and it is it is through that uh, that I met Russell Collins, and I did one of his courses very early on in the piece. I've got a funny anecdote. Um, started business from scratch, and uh, you know, no uh, money per se in the in the bank account. And Russell Collins, within probably about six months at a PD day, did a bit of a session, and he said, "I'm doing this workshop." And at that stage, I think it was five hundred dollars per head, and. Uh, you know, we didn't have much money in the bank, but we decided to spend the five hundred dollars. Me and uh, my former partner Josh Crowther, and did his course, and the rest is history. It was the best investment I ever made, and uh, to this day, I consider him a very dear friend, and uh, I'm um, extremely grateful for um, yeah the advice he's given me and, uh, and the way it's shaped my career. We might dig up some uh, good old Russell Collins info here in the sound guy and put them on the links. <laughs> That's that's him nodding. Another classic yeah. transfer into uh, the audio format. Well done. So so you've now you've kicked off this business. Yes. Whereabouts was it? Uh, in in Carringbella, in the Sutherland Shire. Sort of that's of, 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 of New South Wales. Yes, yes. yes. God's country. Otherwise, yeah. it's 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 otherwise known as uh, Roxy. So um, yeah, started off in the in in the Sutherland Shire, uh, and very early on took a, took out an office in in Carringbella, and uh, we've still got our original office there, which I spend a day a, a week at. Uh, and now we're in town, which is uh, where our, our presence is. Now, tell me about um, uh, your, your formative years, education, your high school years, and whatnot. What led you towards this path of of helping people out financially? Yeah, look, um, as I said, I, I was studying accounting. I, I like numbers, and I like the business of numbers. Um, and uh, whilst I was doing that, I was, I was um, you know, uh, uh, I suppose courted by a life insurance specialist, and I, and he said to me, "Look, you know, you can earn a great living and build a business. Come and try it out." Uh, and at that particular point in time, I uh, I thought, well, I've got nothing left to lose here, and the uh, concept of earning a, a handsome income uh, sort of my eyes lit up as a young twenty six, I think year old uh, that I was, um, and I joined the business, and I could see that. Uh, the fabulous asset that he was he was he was building, just, um, you know, um, doing a very a noble deed, which is protecting people and their families and their incomes. Um, and of course, um, you know, I had a yearning to one day uh, get to the bar when I was a kid, and uh, so the the language of insurance contracts appealed to me as well. So that was another thing. But look, probably by accident, like most of us uh, in in the profession, you know. Generally, as a, a second, um, you know, career, or uh, you know, fall into it by accident. Well, I was, um, I was thinking of being a, a surgeon, but the <laughs> yeah. sight of blood makes me faint. <laughs> so, uh, would have been a very short-lived uh, career. Yes. Now, you've you've got eight people now, but surely you just started off. You said yourself and your your previous partner. Yes. Um, and you so you kicked off in two thousand and five. You had a couple of years, and then we had a real um, scenario globally: the global financial crisis, which yes. which Apart from the fact that it really uh, impacted people with investments, it made people think again about their risk, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. And look, at that particular point in time, we were also um, doing a bit of more broad um, brush financial planning. And uh, gosh, I remember those days, and you probably would too, when certain investments were, um, you know, were frozen. Uh, you'd turn on the news most days and the market was tanking. Um, you know, those conversations as a, you know, I was very, very young to be able to um, calm people's emotions, to reassure people. Um, that was a, a, a baptism of, 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 of fire uh, and really helped build and enhance my communication skills uh, and uh, relationship skills um, with, with with clients. So, um, yeah, it was hard, hard, hard going when we first started. It was, you know... Um, uh, like a lot of people, we built the business from absolute scratch. And you were business writing the whole way through? Sorry? You were the business writer? Indeed, yes. Yeah. So I was the hunter per se um, and, um, you know, you did some cold calling, did all the various different marketing methods that most of us, in, in uh, you know, tried in those those days. And, uh, and Russ Collins said to me when I first started, he said, it's going to be bread and water for five years. And in fact, it was bread and water for probably close to 10 years. <laughs> You can take the Russell Collins link down now. <laughs> <laughs> but lucky you've been doing it 19. Yeah. <laughs> um, at what stage did you have the foresight to bring in a bit more of an operational bent with the uh, the hire of Janelle? Yeah, uh, and a, a, a great question because, um, you know, we weren't uh, in a position where we could um, add the financial resources to get additional help. So, 
you know, we were the marketer, the cleaner, the uh, advisor, the underwriting guy. But um, over the course of the last 19 years, we've um, uh, been fortunate enough to acquire five businesses, one uh, fairly sizable um, and, and one other meaningful. Other, the other three were um, uh, 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 smallish businesses um, and we were fortunate enough in terms of the first acquisition um, Janelle was the right hand of uh, Errol Shivers, whose business that we purchased. Um, and so we got access to this wonderful resource who's been with us um, ever since. Uh, so, so normally in those, um, that, that was a risk book, is that right? Risk, yeah, well, risk and a corporate Super Bowl. Yeah, so normally um, uh, you do a, a merger or an acquisition along yeah. those lines and it's a you know a six to 12 month phase out. But um Janelle, if you're still listening, you're 13 years into your, uh, your your synergy program, so I reckon you may have actually achieved uh, the impossible and actually integrated. Congratulations. Yes, and well, let's hope she's uh, got another 13 years left uh, uh, in the business as well, and uh, she is really the cornerstone and a foundation in our business. Um, and, and equally, I might say, you know, in, during that period, you know, yes, we've successfully merged five businesses, but uh, at last count, I was trying to uh, count them yesterday, we probably sent six, a uh, no to about six uh, businesses as well uh, for one reason or uh, uh, another. Well, this is the Engine Room podcast. You're yes. not just going to throw that line at us. <laughs> what are the reasons? So after a, a person who has purchased five or thereabouts- yes. What were the, the elements, without probably naming the companies, yeah. what were the key things that made you say no? Yeah. Um, look, uh, and, you know, I don't want to seem as though I'm pontificating and, you know, the bloke that's been in business for 19 years, um, but very early on when we were on Bread and Water, we had an opportunity for to acquire a business, um, but um, it was an ordinary business uh, at an ordinary price. Um, so even from the start, we said no. So the first principle, I guess, is, you know, we're happy to buy good businesses, kind of like Buffett and Munger at fair prices, uh, but not, uh, you know, uh, ordinary businesses at good prices. Um, so I think that's that was the first uh, first thing. The other filter was culture fit. Um, I think we, you know, um, for us, it was vitally important that, um, you know, there was a culture fit. What are the vendors' motivations um, in terms of why they're selling? Well, if it's such a great business, or well, why on earth are you getting out? Uh, and thankfully for the um, you know the acquisitions, uh, the four out of the five, those principals uh, were retiring. Um, and given a numbers person, you know um, the financial metrics they had to make sense. What's the buyback period? You know what's um, what's the profitability? Uh, big is not always best. In fact, there are many practices, I would think, that have got dozens of people employed and there are equally uh, making less money than um, some very profitable, sound, um, you know, single man operations. So big is not always best. Um, a, a deep understanding for the financial metrics. And if it didn't make financial sense to us, we walked uh, uh, away from it. You know, Andrew, you, you just don't want to buy yourself a, a high wage, um, which could be a consequence of jumping into an acquisition without necessarily understanding what it's going to do for you and what it's going to do for the the, the business. Uh, well, I, I get, I can, I can feel the undercurrent of that undergrad counting degree <laughs> coming through. <laughs> yes. Um, and whilst you were doing and building out this business in the Sutherland Shire yes. of Sydney. You also gave back a lot with um, time with the the AFA, where I believe you were the um, national president, correct? Yes. Congratulations. Well, thank you. What years were those? Um, well, I took over, I'm, I'm trying to remember now, uh, in 2021 or 2022, uh, from my good friend uh, Mike Novak. So, you know, I've been extremely fortunate to be able to contribute to the the profession, uh, I was involved in policy and uh, from the early FOFA days um, with my good and uh, dear friend Phil Anderson. Um, and you know, again, blokes like Russell Col Collins and the Ilk, you know, they're servers. Um, they they serve, they contribute to the profession, and to a large extent, I think you know, when I look at our team more broadly, um, we're a bunch of lifters, not leaders. We look for ways to serve. We look for ways to contribute. Uh, and I was very fortunate to uh, be at the AFA and uh, work with our team and uh, David Sharp's team and merge the AFA with the FBA and it's now the FAAA, the the legitimate uh, voice for the financial advice profession in the country. Well, I mean, w w while we're back, we're back uh, ending the 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 story of 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 Sam. I'd I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for getting that done, right? Because 
um, it was the most obvious outcome yes. and uh, was well overdue. So thank you. But then maybe just moving gears yes. and, 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 and really digging into these operationals or, or this, I suppose this back office, because in effect, if you didn't have a great engine room, you wouldn't have had the freedom to be able to donate your time and do these other things. It's a, it would have been too messy, correct? Yeah, look, it uh, it it was, and in fact, um, the timing wasn't ideal because I just executed our our, our large uh, acquisition at that particular point in time, and uh, you know, at uh, I um, at that particular point in time, I also took over the AFA presidency, so I had to have considerable trust and confidence uh, in our existing team. Um, and our and our people to get the job done, and um, so yeah, ab- absolutely, uh, we've got a great bunch of individuals deeply dedicated um, to our clients um, and 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 our team and one another. We're like a little little family, um, and had it not been for them, because um, ostensibly I you know spent a good part of two years out of the business um, whilst working at the AFA and uh, on the merger and some quality of advice review work as well. So uh, it's. By, by large, uh, thanks to the existing team. And you mentioned a big family. You've got four children yourself. We were yes. comparing notes. Yes. So uh, it's um, always give a busy man or a busy woman uh, work. And and uh, so your your four kids are are they adults yet? Or yeah, well, one's an adult, uh, eighteen, and the youngest is is twelve. Uh, and and the eldest was very clever, of course. But I uh, was hoping that. She would follow in her father's footsteps and uh, come into our wonderful profession. But uh, uh, nonetheless, she's studying fashion business degree. So hopefully uh, she'll travel the world and take her father with her. And um, She could be so. the next cotton. She could be the next cotton on, Sam. Yes, so, yeah. so maybe just uh, strap in and give us some economic guidance, yeah. I think. So. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, there's certainly my, my motivation Um you know our, our profession. It's and and this great business that uh, I've been lucky enough to build has has provided a fabulous living uh, for myself and uh, the people around me, and I'm very grateful. Well, let's talk about your clients and 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 your actual engine. Yes. So um, you began to uh, mention that you have uh, over a thousand clients. Yes. Um, and predominantly in the 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 specialist insurance Indeed. side of it. Yeah. Um, maybe get a bit, bit of a feel of. How, what's the organisational structure of your, of your business as far as if I was working in it, do I manage uh, a certain number or maybe give us a feel for a day in the life? Yeah, okay. Well, look, um, uh, eight, there's a, a team of eight and we had three advisors where it recently just come down to two um, and, and the rest are our support staff. Um, we find, you know, the fact that we're insurance specialists, that's so much um, niche in a sense and you know, um, it's 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 a specialised uh, area of advice, and we've taken that and we operate in verticals as as well. So um, most of our team have got very clear defined what the, responsibilities. What does a vertical mean in this context? So, so you know, one individual looking after claims, one individual gotcha. doing our power planning, one individual you know um, doing our taking care of our new business. Um, we find that that works really well because everyone knows exactly which lane that they're swimming in. Um, and of course, um, you know, we, we do some cross training uh, 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 across the business. So if someone was to get hit by that variable bus yesterday that, um, the, the, the business doesn't fall apart. So, um, we use offshoring, you know, I know you, uh, have an interest in VBP. Uh, and that was um, that's been a, a, a great tool for our business. Um, and and look, this may not be news to some of the listeners, but you know, one individual in particular, she's now client facing, and she's brilliant. And I had a a very accomplished uh, client ring me the other day, and and he prays upon her uh, at, at, at the quality of her work. So uh, that's pleasing to me, and it's great to see them growing as well. But uh, essentially, a team of eight, largely housed in our. Uh, CBD business, um, but yeah, a dedicated bunch of individuals um, serving our clients. So the clients insurance only. Do you um, do you obtain your clients through referral partners like accountants, or, or maybe get a feel for because you are specialised? Uh, yes. Yeah. So where do you obtain your your business from? Yeah, um, good question. Uh, you know, initially um, through the acquisitions. Um, so. Uh, Early on, uh, we, you know, had a bit of a niche you know, working in pharmacy. Um, that was a, a big corporate client of ours and remains a corporate client of ours. But most of our clients now are um, seem to be in the legal profession. 
Um, so either through referrals from existing clients, the acquisitions, um, and we also play in the corporate space. Um, and uh, that helps us get the referrals as well. We've got a couple of joint venture partners, accounting uh, firms, other financial advisors who realize that insurance is a, a niche, complex business that um, want their clients to look uh, um, get looked after by a specialist firm. Uh, as well as some general brokers um, as well. Look, we like working with professionals and we like work- working with professionals because they value advice because they're in the business of giving advice um, themselves. Um, they're able to synthesize information fairly quickly and make decisions based on fact and we like that trait in our clients. And thirdly and most importantly, um, they've got the economic capacity to pay the premiums to allow us to give them the advice and the service that they need that drives our economic engine. Um, one of my favorite books, if you don't mind me saying, is uh, Collins's Good to Great, uh, where he studies, you know, the top. What are you passionate about? <laughs> <laughs> what are you world's best at? And what drives your economic engine? Well, wow. <laughs> I, I was I was just going to pause to say uh, yeah. the word, the use of the word synthesize was winning the linguistics uh, bingo for the day. But, uh, <laughs> but, but to throw a to throw a classic Venn diagram that I'm passionate about yes. into the mix. Yes. Um. Well, well, well done. And these the professions. Um. I suppose you being a specialist, we might come back to that at the end because quite often I I like to talk to practice owners about. Now, how you'd like to present yourself to the listeners, and the listeners are typically people in our industry or ambitiously wanting to be in there. Yes. Um, and uh, what I'm passionate about is that every facet of the financial planning tapestry, whether it be aged care, life insurance, self-managed super funds, wealth accumulator, cash flow management, deserves its place. Yes. And a specialist in one of those areas, um, we might actually get a bit of a feel for what you're looking in in, in team members. Um, in your future state at the end. So we might, remind me to do that if I forget, Sam. Yes. So I'm actually problem. giving him um, homework. Kieran, is that cool? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah we're, we're, it's at early stage dementia. It is kicking. <laughs> it is Kieran, isn't it? So good. Yep. That's a double nod. And you've got, so you've got, you're, you're, you're outsourcing, but you treat them as part of your team as you intimated there. Well played. Yes. Um, how are you licensed? Yes. We're licensed through um, Bob Bora, who's a risk specialist uh, network. Um, and, um, you know, I've got any, uh, I, this came to mind as I was just, uh, doing some preparation for our, 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 our conversation. And, uh, it's an interesting thing, human psychology. And I remember when, uh, the opportunity came to join Bombora, uh, and I was smart enough to be honest with myself. And I thought, I'm a little bit apprehensive here. Uh, at that particular point in time, probably, I think it was six years ago, Bombora, you know, had a, a very good quality uh, network of top risk practices, some massive egos in there too. And I thought, shout out to all those people for the egos. <laughs> We've been providing a link <laughs> by, good fr- by good friend Chris Mason <laughs> at MBS. But, um, we, you know what, Kieran, we have the opportunity to delete that. But uh, due to my personal relationship with Chris, we might just, we might put it on a loop. Yes, you played soccer with him. I'd be interested to see what his ego was on the soccer field. We're cutting this out now. <laughs> <laughs> He's a half decent left footer. Oh, so <laughs> there you go. But um, look, I, I, you know, I had doubts. I thought to myself, "Shit, am I good enough um, to be in this game?" And I was a bit apprehensive. And that's the god honest truth. And thankfully, I bit the bullet and uh, joined the network. And uh, certainly in terms of uh, that was a a very smart business move. Um, Success breeds success, uh, you know, and you're invariably drawn uh, upwards towards success. And, um, you know, I think we're we're holding our own um, uh, in in A grade. So um, it was an important move and uh, a, a smart move, notwithstanding the initial apprehensions that I had. Well, you, you say so you've, you've moved into that, that um, license many years ago. Yes. Surrounded yourself with like-minded practitioners. Yes. With quite a few of them risk-focused. So, yes. So you did have that, that, I suppose, that intellectual bandwidth and firepower. Yes. With that in mind, um, where did your tech stack end up? Well, I mean, tech in the insurance space is is, is a difficult prospect, um, you know, still Put your waiting. wish list in. <laughs> still waiting for Brett, Brett Wright to uh, uh, sort uh, the system out, but um, we're uh, reliant on X-Plan, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but uh, that that's what we do. Uh, we migrated to Google some years ago, which we thought was significant, Um uh, in our ability to collaborate, uh, both here and offshore, uh, uh, seamlessly. 
Um, and and that's uh, largely it. We're not very sophisticated in terms of our tech stack, Roxy, unfortunately. Well, we'll give uh, we'll give the, the life bit uh, team a shout out, and yes. um, um, we're waiting for the, uh, the the white knight in shining armor to come and help, especially with things like reviews. Yes, and just that 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 imperfect data. Yes, um, financial advice seems to be dominated um, by by assets and 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 funds and. And uh, getting getting contemporary and, and correct data with life insurance has been proven to be quite problematic, and it adds to the ongoing cost of you servicing your clients. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. It's probably one of our biggest bugbears in terms of having access to the data feeds, because otherwise it's a manual uh, a process. Um, you know, and I, I I struggle to see that there'll be any inroads made in that area um, uh, unless life bids able to um, get 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 it up and running. So, um, best of luck to Brett. I know a number of insurers are, are behind him and are supporting him, uh, but um, it's it's probably the most cumbersome area within our uh, our practice. And um, so, a, a quite a, a, a vanilla esque tech stack there. Um, you have purchased a few firms over the years. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier that you, you, you had a business partner and I think you, you guys separate or you, you purchased your business partner or something along those lines. Yes. So you've done a few corporate actions before. Are you the sole owner of the business? Is there any other investors in the business? No other investors in the business. So I am the sole owner. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's good and, and bad because, uh, what's, what's bad about it? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think accountability is important. Um, and I know, um, in, in some of the preparatory questions, you, you had a question about a board of advice, which uh, I don't have. Um, so otherwise I'm only accountable to myself. That being said, I'm fairly driven and focused in terms of how I run the business of the business. Um, but, but certainly, uh, my, uh, board of advice is often catching up with very good friends of mine, uh, always seeking out people that are more successful than me and keeping a very close ear to the ground in terms of, uh, what's happening in the market, levels of profitability, uh, return on equity, return on investment, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Um, so in a sense, my accountability is, um, you know, having those conversations and finding out what, what my competitors and friends are doing and doing my best to emulate them in, in, in the shape of the business that I'd like to, to fashion myself. But, um, a succession planning is, 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 is a risk. It's something I've been turning my mind to over the last six to 12 months. Um, and that's going to be an important question for me to ponder over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. It's interesting because you've been going 19 years and yes. We we sort of uh, threw around the what would the business look in ni- look like in nineteen more years? Yeah, and um, I think that uh, what you've what you've started to do around obtaining that information, looking at other people's models, is definitely there. Um, what I'd urge you to probably do is is start putting some time time frames for yourself. Yes, um, just to hold yourself not to accountability around what you do, but the time frames. Mm. I think that's probably the hardest thing. Mm. Um, regardless of your drive, is just to try and figure that out. Um, I quite often used to do it on my birthday, you know, figuring out what I wanted to achieve. And yes, because the good thing about your birthday is it's the same day. You, know, right? <laughs> you can't keep pushing it back. Now, I, thought you were, I thought you were a smart fellow, but <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. So you've got to put some some basic straight scaffolding in for an otherwise busy mind. Yeah. Um. So you you answered the question about uh, a, a board advisory board and ownership and and whatnot. And um. So at the moment, your previous um uh, business acquisitions were were no doubt debt funded. Is that correct? Uh, uh, yep, yeah, a couple were, a couple weren't. Um, you know, and, and that's another um, a, a really good good point is that um, part of our success is that um, I was fairly driven in terms of amortising the debt on the acquisitions in order to continue to build the balance sheet to allow us to go again. Uh, again. Um, and 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 that's worked uh, well. You know, I was only thinking about this over the course of the weekend. Um, we are in a unique position as financial advisors. Now, I mean, I get to access the best part and, and look and review uh, and research the best part of a thousand balance sheets and P&Ls of my clients. And deep within that uh, those balance sheets, there are secrets as to what works with money, what doesn't work with money, um, you know, and the, the psychology of investing, you know, who makes what, who keeps what. Uh, and what a rich, uh, rich, uh, you know, source of data. So 
you know, I learn a lot more from my clients, certainly about business, uh, than they do from me. And, and I use that to drive my business, uh, decisions, uh, in order to, um, get to, you know, a place of financial independence or as my own advisor says, the F off position, uh, sooner rather than later. But I urge all our listeners who are, uh, are my colleagues to just ponder the fact that, you know, the rich trove of data that we've got to help instruct our own positions because we ought to be taking the same medicine that we're giving to our clients um, as well in relation to financial advice and allocation of capital. So many so many lessons there. You had the, the medicine, which is a heart back to pharmacy days. Then you've also got the scenario now that if you're particularly any of your law clients that are about to meet you in the next couple of days, they might be billing you in six-minute increments. <laughs> um, so uh, be careful what you wish for, Sam. It's, uh, um, but but I, I, I take it as um, uh, as wrote that, yeah, our clients, and I think you mentioned earlier, the ones that take advice, that that, that pay for advice, they value advice, mm-hmm. um, have also been successful in whatever craft or whatever venture they've done in their lives as well. So so completely agree. Mm-hmm. So with – Thank you for sharing a lot about the the details of your business. Mm-hmm. Um, what I wanted to know now, and you mentioned people and culture when you intimated the um, how you deal with your your overseas team, mm-hmm. but eight people um, absorbed quite a few businesses in to the business, which can be problematic. Mm-hmm. But why do people join you? Why do they stay? And how are you going to grow together? Yeah, um, I sort of reflected on how they joined us. Um, and most uh, of the team and and others uh, before them that have come and gone uh, uh, essentially join through um, personal connections and personal referrals. You know, you see birds of a feather flock together. Um, it's only rare that we 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 had to recruit individuals. So I think um, you know finding people with similar values, similar work ethic um, through personal connections has been our success. Uh, how do we get people to grow? I think every voice around the table is critically important. So we have regular get-togethers, two six-monthly strategy meetings and uh, twice-a-week meetings in terms of okay. whip. Let's slow it down. Right. So you do a six-monthly strategy meeting with your whole team. Yes. Where it's documented. Yes. And you do a weekly- Two weekly meetings. A, a two weekly meetings. Yes. So I want to know what you talk about at the strategy meeting. Yes. And then I'd like to get an idea of the cadence- and the content of your your weekly meetings. Yeah. Um, look, our most recent strategy meeting was at the start of this year. Um, and essentially, because I'd been missing from the business for the best part of two and a half years because my AFA and other, other work, and um, it was really, you know, we're brutally honest with with ourselves and our, and our, and our business. And uh, we looked at, you know, Back to basics. What are our strengths, and 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 really be truthful about what are our weaknesses, and what are your strengths? Number one, people. I know it's cliche, but we couldn't serve the type of clients that we've got to the extent that they're used to being served without a team of dedicated individuals. Language is vitally important to me, and I once had someone says when you, when someone say when you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are, um, and I observe the language uh, that that our team uses, and it's always our team, our clients, our business, and that has been the uh, case uh, for a very long time. Um, so, uh, yes, that you know, looking at our strengths and, and, and looking at uh, what our weaknesses are, and there were a few glaring ones. Training was, was one of them, if we were frank. I didn't ask you for your weaknesses, but I'm happy, I'm happy to listen because we, we only learn we, we learn when we bleed. So, <laughs> so, um, so training. What do you mean by that? I mean, you're an acknowledged specialist in life insurance. So, what possible training could you and your team um, be after? Yeah, well, look, we we had a couple of new team members join us in the last eighteen months, and uh, and and to a degree because we're a mature business um, and and we're expected to run. Um, uh, we 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 threw a couple of people into the deep end, um, and on on reflection, they missed the fundamental, um, you know, basic training of, of of business and how things operate, how to follow their bouncing ball. So we've addressed that. We put a training plan in place. But but was there life insurance specific issues there? Um, I, I, there, there there's quite a few life insurers. They'll be listening. Yes. So is there anything that you would you would um ask? Yes. Um, not just for your own self serving benefit, but yes. for I suppose the, the the further ingratiation of younger people in 
that insurers could do potentially for soft skills? Yeah, look, um, a, a really good one, but I'd take that one step further back. We had a young fellow join us who helped. Um, currently his, his, his role is a casual, he helps me with business reporting and um, running some special projects uh, that we have run from time to time. But we assume that they, um, you know, and it's no slant on the individual, but know how to communicate via email professionally to a, a, a client, you know. So it's just basic things like that. Um, even my 18-year-old, if I put her in front of the computer and said, off you go, write an email to XYZ client, uh they wouldn't necessarily know how to structure that. So some basic business training, um, which Janelle has spearheaded, and uh, more broadly insurance um, training for, for for other team members. And our, our great BDMs uh, have helped us with that. Um, we have got great rela- – I, I mentioned people when you asked us about our strengths, so our people's our, our team, our people's our clients, but also um, you know our stakeholders. Um, we go about things politely – honestly and with a great de- degree of integrity and I think for that we're a well-regarded business in the marketplace importantly with our, our partners at the insurance um, companies and otherwise. No, oh, And um, I hope that they think the same of you and that um, you mentioned a couple of BDMs in there. I'll let you percolate as to um, who you'd like to give a shout out to yes. but there's there's always one or two that, that are standouts Yes, um, and it might be that they've always been standouts, or it might be they've just clicked with your team, or it might be they've just got the lighter load yes. um, in their allocation because they can be quite stretched BDMs. Yep. So, um, you know, a, a shout out to the the, the much maligned and, and quite often overworked BDMs in, in, in across your whole industry. I think you hit the nail on the head, and they are overworked and underappreciated, especially in the insurance market. They've been jammed over the last few years. Um, you know, their numbers are as difficult to hit and, uh, you know, they're often wearing the brunt of us advisors, but, um, you know, people that pick up the phone and, and always call back, uh, Declan O'Connor at MetLife comes, comes to mind as one immediately, but we are blessed with an, a number of, uh, BDMs that are friends of our business, um, and, uh, as well as, 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 as underwriters and, uh, we regularly thank them by hosting some drinks on our lovely balcony at uh, uh, on King Street Wharf there, and thank them. And I uh, know oh that's um, appreciated by them, but that's because we appreciate them. And um, so, getting down to the the more mundane, the the, the biweekly work in progress meetings. Yes. Um, and then I'll just take a step back. Are you all? Well, you're not all in the office because you get some people overseas. Yeah. So are you? A, are you a, a completely remote? Are you half and half? Give me an idea of 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 the way in which you guys run in offices and whatnot, then how you do your work in progress meetings, please. Yeah. Um, so fairly fe- flexible, but um, typically, you know, four days uh, in the office and a day uh, um, from home, um, you know, fairly flexible in terms of the work, but with a deep sense of responsibility. Um, so with that flexibility comes that uh, responsibility. Uh, I often say, and I was traveling a fair bit over the course of the last two and a half years for various reasons, uh, work is what I do, not where I am. So um, provided, um, you know, the team gets their work done. Uh, A great example at the moment, um, this wasn't initially my idea, but, um, you know, uh, 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 an advisor in our firm is currently working out of the UK. Her partner's um, got a gig playing counter cricket and uh, Kristen said to me, I want to go overseas. Is that okay? For six months, and uh, my initial thinking was that you know she'll be taking uh, her leave and 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 then some unpaid leave. But uh, um, uh, you know the advice was, well, you will uh, you'll be doing them a favour, but they'll also be doing you a favour by keeping Kristen on. So Kristen um, has stayed on. Uh, she logs on at uh, uh, two in the morning our time, which is five in the morning in the UK time. So she sees clients between two and six. But um, you know, uh, it's 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 an indication of the willingness uh, to to be flexible um, with people uh, with with team members that are, are, are a valuable part of our team. And trust is the is the cornerstone of that. We live in a wild, wildly connected um, era. Yes. Um, only last week, um, I was catching the train home. And I got a, a, a Teams call from my business partner who's currently in the Isle of Man. Right. So he's in, he's in a remote Isle of Man. Um, uh, our operations division has called in from um, a, a place in Asia, in the Philippines, in Cebu, and I'm on a moving train. And we had the gall to complain about about five seconds of when it stopped transmitting. Right. And I've just gone, can we all just chill out? 
Yeah. Do you understand? I'm on a train. You're on the other side of planet Earth, <laughs> yeah. and you're in between. And it and and we had five seconds of interrupted stuff. So so just thinking back to 19 years ago. Yes. Um. You know when you started. Yes. 2005, which I rest assured I was around for, and and you know the the fact that you would have had paper based file notes and an abacus, um, <laughs> and that uh, um, um, X plan was was just a series of pebbles on the ground. Um, it has it has moved a long way. Um, so in those in those meetings, do all the advisors that did you so did your advisors attend the operational meetings? Uh, yes, we do. So the the two two weekly meetings, our yep. team meetings, um, and, and and part of the feedback of the strategy meetings were well, the the weekly meetings are a bit dry and they go on for a little bit too long. Uh, we thought now we're going to spice this up, so we've introduced a concept of you know word for the week. Someone shares it, but. It's funny. Word for the week. Word for the week, you know. Oh, what was the word for the week last week? What was the word for the week last week? <laughs> My, mine was xenophobe um, this uh, this morning, but it adds a, a bit of lightheartedness to it, expands our our, our, our knowledge and, um, you know, uh, and, and the other incredible thing is, and, and I think about the quality of our team, they're all, um, um, mostly all, uh, avid readers. So they, they expand their knowledge, whether it be fiction or non-fiction or whatever, and um, you know that translates into being quality human beings. I think as um, as as well. So you so you've got the verbiage Olympics with word smithery. <laughs> is that what we're saying? Yeah. And I don't know what another word for thesaurus is, but I'll look it up in a book <laughs> that's laying around here somewhere. But uh, yes, we we often just do, go through our whip really quickly, short and sharp, um, and get a sense of people's our, our team members' workloads just to ensure no one's drowning. I have a saying that you know work is what we. Um, we 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 uh, you know work to live. We don't live to to work, and and critically, we don't perform perform uh, brain surgery. You know, um, so if something's got to wait and we can't get to it, it's not. Um, you know, we're not in some ED uh, doing uh, you know ICU style work where people's lives depend depend on it. That doesn't say we that doesn't mean we're reckless uh, or we're slots, but um, you know, keeping things in context. Yeah, agreed, agreed, and. Um- so that's what you do. How do you reward your people? Do you have a, uh, a, a, a any discretionary bonuses, and, or, or do you have like social events? What's it like to have fun in your practice? Yeah, look, we uh, do a number of number of social events. People have their birthday days off. Um, we often, you know, team team bonding and and lunches. God, it must suck to be born on that leap year. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Thankfully, we don't have anyone born in there. I'd change the date. I'd change the date. That's just a rot. You can't get. You can't get your. What is it? Your your, your free beer with every pizza. Like you know, like yeah. it just sucks. But yeah. go on. Your birthday's off. Your birthday day is off. Uh, regular team lunches after our planning uh, planning days, which is a good one. We do have discretionary bonuses. We tried to build some science into it, and. For the life of me, and 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 uh, you know uh, Janelle, who I took some advice on, and some some other people that we spoke to, we just couldn't get it to work. And then we thought, well, you know what, um, we can be fairly disciplined in in certain areas of the bis- business, but who really cares? We can be flexible in other areas. We're not BHP, nor do we have any aspirations to be BHP as well. Um, time off, uh, Kristen to grow, uh, develop a, uh, a leadership and communication skills. Volunteered under the raise program at um, our local high schools there, um, you know, at the business's expense, um, and only gave it up when um, she couldn't manage it in terms of her workload. So, so that was a charitable program yes. brought to you by one of your team members mm. that you financially funded. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Is that uh, is that kind of how you make decisions around charitable pursuits, or, or do you have a system? Yeah, we don't we don't have a system, um, sadly, but uh, it was something that I used to do volunteering in our local schools, and um, and uh, we just felt as though Krista needed to grow and grow her leadership and communication skills, and uh, that was the one that came to mind. Quite a worthwhile uh, community endeavour, and um, you know, so uh, programs like that, um, you know, that I'm happy to financially support our team members um, to. Pursue their passions and 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 grow as individuals. So um, they're the they're the main ones. And um, with all this workplace flexibility, <clears throat> with with you know, you mentioned that you're four days a week um, together, or one day uh, collectively not. Um, have you tried any flexibility that didn't work? Yeah, uh, um, we over the last quarter trialed a um, earned day off a fortnight uh, program. Unfortunately, we just couldn't get it to work. Uh, Why is that? Now, the 
the post mortem will be at our July strategy strategy meeting. Uh, perhaps the metrics were uh, unachievable, uh, especially given we've had some changes to the team over the last um, quarter. Um, so I, I, yeah, I suspect that is the the answer. Um, so we'll just have to have a deep dive and 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 look at it because I'd really um, like to um, um, ensure that um, you know we that 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 succeeds because I want to give uh, our team uh, some time back uh, in their lives to spend with their families or go and play golf or go and watch Netflix or whatever it is. So uh, we'll be having a close look at that and um, hopefully uh, giving it a second crack. Uh, Nick. So, financial year. so if I work in your business, um, what are your critical numbers? Like, what, 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 what things do you obsess about um, on a on a daily and weekly basis? Yeah. Um, so certainly our, our, our new new business numbers. Um, so do you uh, annual premium or lives insured? Is that uh, terminology by, by premium? Yeah. yeah. And uh, lapse rates is a, yep. a, a, a critical one. What do you us. do to help lower your lapse rate? Because a lot of people listening here. As life insurance has ratcheted up in yeah. the last five or six years, what's something that you can offer our listeners that you might think uh, will assist them with managing lapses? Yeah, it's a, a really good question, and uh, I think you know, given that we're specialists, and part of a, well, uh, one element of our weekly meetings is that we look at all our clients up for for renewals for that particular um, uh, uh, week coming up, a month in advance, and um, you know do the necessary benchmarking or have a look at the levels of increase as on their premiums and proactively and and, and engage and work for the client. Invariably we're doing reductions, we're rebrokering, um, and you know, we're we're lucky enough to be advising a wealthy client base and as their assets continue to grow and their need for insurance continue to reduce. So we're not afraid to have those conversations. They result in lapses, but I think the counter argument is is the quality of our service uh, enables us to um, and pick up referrals. Um, um, so, uh, lapses, um, uh, new business target uh, targets, and we've certainly uh, over the last uh, four or five months started to keep numbers on how long it takes to produce an SOA, how long um, you know uh, applications are in in, in the pipeline, etc. Drew Bird, my good friend at MBS, um, they're great at this sort of data. Uh, we're certainly not as as big as them, and have no aspiration to be. But I think um, having that data allows us to have a deep understanding of the business, um, as simple as it is, and that's what we're achieving, uh, trying hard to do. Well, I interviewed Drew in this very seat um, yes. uh, last year, so um, you're right. Uh, obsessing about that cost of acquisition and that cost of delivery, yes, um, is quite important. But it's also it's also um, eye watering in that um, the way where LIF legislation is. Has put um, life insurance for the new business is quite compromised. It's it's quite difficult to to break even on the acquisition of clients un, unless they're wealthy. And um, this is my own personal opinion, listeners. Um, when I got into financial planners, wasn't planning wasn't to make wealthy people wealthier. Mm. It was to help the lower and middle class break through that glass ceiling. And um, uh, yet again, um, even in life insurance. Mm. Um, with the uh, the difficulty in obtaining new business at that capped rate mm. on lower premiums, um, makes it tough. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know the people that really need our help aren't, aren't getting it. Uh, I think it's income. I mean, there's there's no greater time to be a financial advisor in Australia and to belong to this great profession. I mean, you think about the under insurance crisis. You think I think the number is seven hundred and fifty billion transferring from accumulation into pension uh, over the next few years. Australians have never been wealthier. Um, so not all Australians. Not well, yeah, yes, true. Fit, yes. But but um you're right, there's a mm. big transfer. Yes. But still deep down, there's been an artificial impost put into all of the businesses in Australia, which makes it quite difficult for a uh, for us to, to be able to advise more of Australians. Without a shadow of a doubt, looking at the budget papers um, recently, I think there's something like 8.3 million taxpayers with a taxable income under $135,000. So it's incumbent upon us uh, as a profession to look for ways or to promote ways of um, of um, you know accessible and affordable financial advice uh, for 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 those particular. Uh, Australians, um, waiting for the government to give us a solution is not going to be the answer. Um, you know, things like the CSLR and the ASIC literature, I, I doubt the government's going to 
you know, cut a check. When you look at the forward estimates, I think we're going to rack up something like $100 billion in deficits over the course of the uh, four or five financial years. So government won't be the solution. Um, and whilst, uh, you know, we want to serve as clients that drive our economic engine, I think it's also incumbent upon us to look for ways to help the Australians that most need our advice. And that would be uh, my great hope for our, our profession in terms of how we look for ways to give back. And, um, you know, this leads me on to the, the, the vision for the future, which you've, you've sort of begun there. And um, and the the fact that you mentioned that the current, uh, well, the, the place that the Australian government, which creates the legislation um, uh, that governs our industry, has found itself with, with um, you know, its, its debt situation, Maybe looking overseas, um, in your time with the AFA, did you um, have much sort of exposure to other markets globally on how, if they got to this sort of juncture, um, what they did in their life insurance um, sort of structuring and did it work? Yeah, look, I um, we di- didn't, didn't um, you know, uh, commission any research uh, per se, but I know a number of participants have looked at the UK model and, and, and others and you know, New Zealand, uh, where commissions are, are higher. Uh, Sorry. So just were they higher because they were lower? Well, what what happened there? What was the story for our for people who may not know? Well, yeah. So, so um, in New Zealand, as, yep. I, as I understand it, um, you've still got um, high commissions up front, which cover the cost of acquisition. Yep. Um, the UK model, as I understand it, tried to eradicate commissions, but that didn't work. Um, and the, so they've now reintroduced it. Um, so far as Australia goes, I, 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 I don't think there will be any political appetite to increase commissions. I, I think um, I just can't see that happening under the Labor government or perhaps even if the coalition wins. So we've got to look at alternative solutions, which are really to reduce the cost of providing that advice. Agreed. Um, or, um, you know, uh, John Trowbridge, as much as uh, many of us don't like his LIFT-related proposals, but he had an initial advice payment fee, which is, you know, payment – um, to help us subsidise, uh, you know, servicing those slower, lower premiums, um, perhaps a, a variation of that, which is what the AFA put into our collective advice review. Uh, Michelle found it too difficult. Michelle Levy to to um, recommend uh, something like that. Where do you sit those? Um, where do you have those thresholds? So, um, I, I, I think it necess- necessitates a fair. Uh, amount of consideration and some planning to look at some alternative models because the current uh, model just isn't working. I mean, I sat with an insurer for lunch, the CEO, and he was talking about the fact that, you know, made $5 million worth of profit. Um, and that is just crazy uh, numbers and it's not sustainable. I mean, you'd invest in a you know 10-year government bond at 4.2%, 4.3%. Why would you bother running a life insurance company in Australia? Yeah, and I think that um, you're right. It's, it's all stakeholders are impacted. Mm. Um, and look, thank you very much for that that overview. And um, uh, it was interesting that that, you, that we've got ourselves into this particular scenario. Mm. I think um, in the back of everyone's mind, they thought there was this invisible hand. I don't know what they thought, but that someone else was going to fix it, mm. or that someone else hasn't come. But getting back to your vision for the future for the sorts of practices. Now, you're, you're stoically and proudly an insurance specialist. Mm-hmm. You've got joint ventures in other financial advice practices mm-hmm. as well as accounting practices who refer you clients. Mm-hmm. You've got the verticals where you've got specialists in claims, which I think potentially um, you, you've undersold yourself there because people um, don't care what the application's like. They care the claim process. Mm. And as someone who has had quite a few claims in my, my it's almost 30 year career, mm-hmm. um, it, it really comes out that knowledge of, of what to do and, and, and how to do it, which helps and I suppose is rewarding. I mean, it's a really funny thing. Um, the, the process of a claim, which is quite often the client's worst moment of their life, can be the most rewarding as a practitioner, would you mm. agree? Ab- absolutely. And, um, you know, we do a number of claims and we take them very, very seriously. And that's when the rubber hits the road, um, you know, and, and you realize how complex it can be because it's not just a case of, you know, filling in a form and sending it to it. But um, Well, that amateur legal and um, um, sort of aspirations help, doesn't it? Reading <laughs> <laughs> well, if you need to have a body, I think it <laughs> definitely helps. But uh, it's my firm belief that, that our partners, our insurers, they're in the business of paying legitimate claims. And I've had no reason to believe otherwise, nor have I seen otherwise in the course of my 19-year uh, career. But um, it's it's a noble 
uh, area of the profession that we work in, and uh, you know, we're pleased to continue to um, work in well, that. Well, ironically, I, I, I concur with that. I mean, every advised policy that I've ever um, been involved with that got to a claim has paid, yes, um, a, a, either fully or, or thereabouts. Um, sadly, the unadvised policies, which seems to be where they've been directed, have been where there's been problematic. Um, Indeed. With yourself uh, and your own aspirations for growing your business, I mean, you mentioned the concept of being hit by a bus, um, which uh, from memory, that was always something that we said when we were selling life insurance. But um, what's what's the play with your business, the succession plan? And, and in saying that, after listening to you and, and getting that energy and that warmth um, over the course of this podcast, mm-hmm. are you in the market for recruiting um, aspirational people who want to be insurance specialists? Yeah. Um, so thank you. I think, you know, certainly the same level of thinking that has led us to, you know, almost 19 years isn't, uh, we're honest enough with ourselves uh, to, to know that it's not going to get us to the next 19 years, if in fact that's where I want to uh, be. Oh, my goodness, I'll be 63. Um, so succession plan is an important uh, element. It's often on my mind because I don't think um, if I got hit by that bus yesterday, the the estate will be able to extract the same level of value that I would um, had I been around and be able to negotiate a exit. Um, you know, I think it's prudent. Uh, and if I consider myself a business owner and a business person that, um, yeah, I, I consider that risk. Um, I'm having a number of, uh, of conversations or have been doing a bit of research over the course of the last 12 to 18, 18 months and, you know, may well be taking some money off the table. I, I, I don't know, uh, to help shore off, uh, shore up that risk. Um, absolutely. I think human nature, uh, in particular, uh, I don't like sitting still. It doesn't mean that I'm driven. Uh, uh, or you know the the business is what defines me, but certainly uh, uh, a need to expand. And in that context, um, we are absolutely open and looking to partner with accounting planning practices that want to get their clients looked after and specialise. Um, uh, you know, it, in, with a specialist insurance firm, uh, one more acquisition is probably not out of the question uh, question either. Um, so growth ambitions. How far does that go? Uh, I don't know, but absolutely interested in partnering with um, individuals and practices to serve their needs whilst contemplating uh, my own succession. Uh, and, and, and the third element is looking, um, there are a couple of key people in our uh, team uh, looking to retain and reward um, them. That will- And you've answered, how do they grow? <laughs> there you go. We got there. Um, <laughs> if I can s- summarise, thank you very much for that. If I can summarise that, um, you're always open for joint ventures where you where you look after the uh, interests of the clients of accountants and yes. financial planners, and one of the one of the I suppose um, key parts of that is because you are a specialist. Um, There's a real re- moat around mm-hmm. those clients, that sovereignty, and you report back into the partners mm-hmm. on progress and whatnot of the clients. It's a it's a it's a good one there. Um, you're also uh, open for anyone out there who's got a bit of a generalist at the moment, but may or may not be. They might have fallen out of love of the life insurance mm-hmm. part of their business. As you've got to be hyper efficient to make a dime, um, those sorts of practices um, who might have a, a, a small or, or a sort of small relative to the rest of their business, book mm-hmm. of business, might be worth considering for you as well. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the young people coming through, not even young, young at heart, how's that sound, um, who see life insurance and the concept of that risk management um, as their profession mm. over and above asset management and whatnot, um, you're open for business. Absolutely, yes. And they don't have to move to the Shire. You'll, 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 it's, uh, <laughs> it's not compulsory. And, and they don't have to support the- That's country. They don't have yeah. to, they have to, they have to they, they, there is quite another part yeah. as well, <laughs> Sam. Um, I'm not sure you're aware of that. Yeah. And uh, there are other football teams as well. <laughs> but um, with that in mind, I'd like to thank you for your contribution to the industry. I'd like to thank you for your time and your candor today and wish you all the best in the next phase of your career. Thank you very much, Sam. Roxy, it was my great pleasure and I thoroughly enjoyed our chat and, um, yeah, all the best. Cheers. Cheers.